this evening. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce our illustrious panel on the event in St. Catharines tonight. My name is Neve Gallagher. I'm a fellow of St. Catharines College and co-convener of the Future of the Island of Ireland seminar series. <clears throat> I'd like to invite you all to the college. The college was founded in 1473. It has been an intellectual home for many disciplines across the decades, across the centuries. And more recently, it has become a home for a discussion of British-Irish relations and Irish affairs more generally. <clears throat> the last major event we had, we had here was in 2019, just before the pandemic, where we had a panel discussion about the Belfast Good Friday Agreement with former Secretaries of State for Northern Ireland, Paul Murphy and John Reid, and the then leader of the House of Lords, Angela Smith. <clears throat> I have no doubt that that topic will pop up yet again this evening in tonight's discussion. And I'm delighted to be continuing this tradition of making St. Catharines a neutral space for the, the discussion of the future of these islands and Irish affairs more generally. So with my other hat on, I'd like to say something about the future of the Island of Ireland series. As you all hopefully would have noticed when you sat down, there was a business card on your seat. Uh, it has a QR code in the back. If you don't know what that is, Please do have a quiet word with the person <laughs> beside you and they will tell you. The Future of the Island of Ireland series has grown from strength to strength due to the efforts of my colleague here, Barry Colfer, who really helped bring it to Zoom Lab in 2020. So really, thanks to Barry that we've really kicked off with this interesting series. I'd also like to thank Professor Eugenio Biagini, who is here, who helped to bring it to life at the beginning of those 2020 days, and the Centre for Geopolitics, who are a partner of ours. It was recently awarded a small grant by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in recognition of the good work we are doing here at Cambridge today. And today I'm delighted to launch our website, which the magic QR code on that business card will enable you to find. And alternatively, alternatively if that's too difficult, please just do type in the web address, which is on that business card as well. Our website contains our past conversations. We've had perhaps over 20 of them. And you can now read about them, you can re-watch them, and all future events will be advertised there as well. So please have a look, join our mailing list and follow us on social media. We want this series to develop, right? My my, my, well, I'm asking you a favor, please spread the word about us. We are a small team, myself, Barry, and our fabulous coordinator, Iona here doing the Zoom for us today. It is the only series connecting the public to leading figures in the political, social, economic, and cultural life of these islands in conversation with expert academics. It is an inclusive space for all viewpoints concerning with, concerned with the future. So please stay involved and help us grow. Okay, so some housekeeping. Um, the facilities are downstairs, should you need to use them? So we would kindly ask if you can possibly refrain throughout the duration of somebody's, uh, one of our panelists' talk, that would be great. So you don't have to disturb them and walk past. The event is being recorded and possibly live streamed if we manage to get that working. Oh, yeah. um, fantastic. So if you do ask a question, and I really hope you do, please, we're going to assume your consent, right, for that being recorded and um, streamed online. So I'm going to hand over to Barry now for the formal introductions to our panelists and to say a little bit more about the event tonight. But can I just say that I'm really thrilled to be here in association with the Institute of, of International and European Affairs in Dublin, a major and very important think tank, and it's great that we can begin this collaboration. So thank you very much for joining us today. That's my name, Luke. And that's a nice point in which to hang over. So my name is, is Barry Colfer. I know many of you, and for those I don't, it's lovely to be here with you. Uh, I'm the Director of Research at the Institute of International European Affairs in Dublin, but I'm also a fellow at St Edmunds in, um, in Cambridge. So this is nice for me that it's bringing together my kind of two affiliations and two passions. And I'm really, really happy to add on to what Neo said, that this is our 21st meeting. And the meetings happened initially back with Eugenio and myself in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, and it was just a kind of a thing we did to fill the time between the days. And now it's something I think really nice and important. And it's, it's great to be a part of it. I'm going to just very quickly uh, read out the biographies of our speakers. But just before that, I was thinking on the way over here that this series and those who follow it are interested in the future of the island of Ireland, obviously, and many people who, who have that shared passion will be thinking about Vicky Phelan, I'm sure you heard today, who was a fearless and very important accidental campaigner who uh, shone light on, on, on uh, controversy of, of unspeakable um, 
uh, sadness in Ireland, the cervical cancer controversy. And certainly when, if this series continues and people continue to write the story of Ireland, it's social history and political history, Vicky will be a very important figure in that. So I'm thinking about her as I'm sure many people are as well. And I just wanted to mention her briefly before going to the biographies by Irish. So tonight, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Andrew McCormick. Andrew, it's lovely to meet you tonight in person, finally. Andrew is the former Director General of International mm -hmm. Relations for the Northern Ireland Executive, uh, representing the Executive of the Specialised Committee on the Protocol, and you are the NI Executive's lead official on Brexit. And if I may say, uh, a great voice of, of reason and a great resource in these times as we try to understand what it is that's happening on these islands. Our first respondent is going to be Katie Hayward, also Katie, someone I feel like I know. Lovely to meet you here in person for the first time. It's not the Hayward. first time. <laughs> 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 I'm going to continue that. <laughs> 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 Professor Hayward is Professor of Political Sociology at Queen's University of Belfast, a senior fellow at the UK in a changing Europe think tank. Like it is a major ESRC funded project on the topic of the future status of Northern Ireland after break. But thanks for being with us in person, Katie. And our final respondent will be David O'Sullivan. David is the IA's Director General, formerly served as the Secretary General of the European Commission, the Ambassador of the EU Delegation to the US, and as the Chief Operating Officer of the EU's Diplomatic Service. Now, unfortunately, Sir Jeffrey Donaldson MP did drop out, and the GUP were unable to send a substitute, which is unfortunate, but we did really try. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Niamh, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, everyone, for being with us. Thank you, Barry. Okay, so the format of today's talk, um, Andrew is going to speak for about 15 minutes based on a paper that he had written and was pre-circulated. Then each panelist will have up to 10 minutes to, uh, to reflect on that, to respond to that. Um, Andrew can then please come back and respond to some of what's been said. We'll then open up to Q&A for about 40 minutes. Um, and then panelists will be invited to wrap up for about two minutes each. And the Q&A will involve both yourselves and of course are considered an online audience as well. So no further ado, Andrew, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks also indeed, Nick and Barry. It's a great privilege uh, to be here this evening and uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, introduce a discussion which I, I hope will be uh, lively and challenging. And I'm very sure of that. Um, I've been writing about these issues for a few months now and I uh, think there are still a few things that need to be, need to be said and explored because you know, six years on, uh, finding a way forward on the implications of Brexit for Northern Ireland is still an unsolved problem. There are some good signs of hope from the current discussions and that's all good, uh, but there is undeniably an enormous gulf between the protocol as it stands and the expectations of unionists resulting from the Protocol Bill. So around the same time as, as uh, IAEA published uh, the paper in, in August, uh, uh, Katie and, and Jill Rutter and Catherine Bernard and, and Jonathan Stevens and I were thinking about and exploring a few things and uh, two points arising from that. That's the um, point that Jonathan made in that blog in August about the fact that all the process up to this point has not been inclusive of the leaders of Northern Ireland, uh, and that actually, from his long experience uh, in the NI, I first met Jonathan in 1992, and he and I were junior officials working in the talks under Sir Patrick Mayhew. Uh, but so he knows this backwards and knows that a process that is commands confidence and is inclusive of local interests is absolutely vital. The other point is then that Jill set out the challenge that actually an independent fact-based review of the protocol um, might clarify the issues uh, and identify possible ways forward. And so uh, there was a paper then which uh, UK and Changing Europe published on that not so long ago. Andrew, do you mind if I ask you just to sit down for our owl camera, which isn't getting the first Okay, fine. Okay, thank you. Fine, sure. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so. Um, there have been repeated statements from UK ministers that the outcome they're seeking uh, and they will insist on from the negotiations is the same, the substance of the protocol bill. So we need to look at uh, not just the means of, that they're seeking to use, but what are they trying to achieve? What, what's actually going on here? So just to frame what I want to say, 
Um, I want to highlight, first of all, self-determination as an issue and concept and the relevance of that. A bit then about the interpretation of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Then if I touch briefly on, on there, there's quite a lot that could be said, an immense amount that could be said about the technical aspects of both the protocol and the bill. And um, I just want to take one aspect of that, you know, given the time available, and then just, just draw a few thoughts together at the end. So um, self-determination is actually the link between the fundamentals of the union, partition, the troubles, the Good Friday Agreement, and Brexit. <clears throat> They're all issues of self-determination. And the problem is defining what the word people means. And we take Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson's famous quotation, what does is, what is people mean? What's the unit of determination? What, what group of people have the right to exercise self-determination? So the amazing thing about the Good Friday Agreement is that it effectively resolved that issue for the first time in history. Um, the Republican movement, uh, based on, a lot on the outcome of the 1918 general election, which in their playbook uh, said that the whole of Ireland voted on the same day for a unitary independent republic. The majority, that's the unit of determination, and the will of that majority should be recognised. Even in that period, um, British ministers were looking at self-determination for, for unionists, uh, although they didn't wrestle with that all that clearly. And um, as a matter of fact, both the principle of partition and especially the boundary of Northern Ireland were imposed. There were no plebiscites, there were plebiscites around the same time in schleswig holstein and Silesia, but not in County Tyrone or County Fermanagh, which have clear Catholic majorities. So their consent was not given. And this actually is a very, very important driver behind the Republican movement's worldview. So that's why the, the referenda in 1998 was so significant because the whole of the island voted on the same day to approve the Good Friday Agreement and hence determine that that, that settled the constitutional issue in that way. And what we'll, we'll summarize it is this, the large unit of determination, the whole of the island agreed that Northern Ireland would be for the future, the unit of determination, absolutely fundamental to settlement and linked of course, to all the other aspects of the agreement. So this is, this is uh, the consensus and compromise that emerged, the compromises, especially the significance of North-South cooperation, uh, which featured so heavily in the whole de Brexit debate. So then Brexit is, of course, an act of self-determination. What was not noticed at the time was the significance of the fact that Northern Ireland was part of another different, larger unit of determination. And Brexit as a constitutional change was taken forward without regard for the interaction between Northern Ireland as a, as a, uh, a unit of determination and the whole of the UK. So that complicated things and was never identified and, and is, I think, actually quite significant in the present, present time in that the Good Friday Agreement said that it was for Northern Ireland to determine its own constitutional future. Then the withdrawal agreement comes along and it is, gives, is an agreement which gave Northern Ireland a power of decision on the impact of Brexit through the consent mechanism that was agreed. So let me put this ironically, that like the Good Friday Agreement, the withdrawal agreement gives Northern Ireland the final say on its own constitutional future by simple majority. The protocol bill, the problem with the protocol bill is that if that reverts to a process of imposition of a settlement rather than mm -hmm. seeking a settlement by agreement and consent. And just to be clear, you mean the Northern Ireland Protocol Northern Ireland Bill Protocol. as opposed to the protocol as a part of the Yes, protocol the protocol bill, absolutely. So the reference in the bill to the Act of Union is 
a demonstrable contradiction of the obligation of the UK government in the Good Friday Agreement to exercise its powers with rigorous impartiality on behalf of all the people. Now, self-evidently, the Act of Union was favoured by unionists and opposed by nationalists and republicans. So by asserting the overarching power of the UK Parliament, the bill undermines the principle of self-determination of the people of Northern Ireland that was so carefully established in 1998. So I think alongside the issues of constitutional law that uh, have been the subject of very clear judgments by uh, the Northern Ireland courts and will be considered shortly by the Supreme Court, I think it's also relevant to look at um, the, the fact that the two parliaments that passed the Acts of Union in 1800 did not do so with consent. There was no support at any stage for the Acts of Union for, from the majority of the people in Ireland, self-evidently. The, the long journey from 1801 to 1922 began with a campaign for repeal. The Act of Union is an example of the law of the strong, where sovereignty is a reflection of power rather than of rights. And the Good Friday Agreement, as at the other end of the spectrum on that, established sovereignty subject to consent. And as I said, consent on the basis of simple majority. So the government's case for the bill includes the argument that because the DUP is not willing to enter the executive under the present circumstances, it is urgent, indeed a necessity in international law to act as they're currently proposing. There are several points that I think are impossible to reconcile between that, that stance and uh, the, the, the government's legal position and these points of fact. So, first of all, the word inherent appears a lot in the government's legal opinion. Uh, checks on goods entering Northern Ireland from Great Britain were inherent in the protocol. So nothing, nothing in the operation of the protocol uh, was not foreseen. Indeed, the basic approach was, was proposed uh, in the Prime Minister's letter of October 2019. And all that we were doing when I was working in, in the executive office in that period was um, trying to understand and explore what it would mean. And there was a lot of work done in the period between 2019, between the agreement in October 2019 and the start of the implementation in 2021. So the position is that uh, the UK government knew in detail all the issues of the, of the way the protocol would operate that was well established. Um, so to in, intervene to ensure that quote unquote uh, east-west connections are restored, that's actually contradictory to the whole nature of the, of the protocol as the essence of which was proposed by uh, the government in uh, the October 2019 letter. Second point on this is that unionist opposition to the protocol was explicitly foreseen in the terms of the consent mechanism. So the barrier or peril that, that they've talked about, it arises from escalation of unionist opposition, specifically DUP opposition, uh, and that results that is shown by a clear change of mind uh, up to January 21, the attitude was I would characterize it as, as clear opposition, but, but acquiescence. But from February on, it was changed to very firmly rejection of the protocol. The second, third, third thing there is that the UK specifically did contribute to the problem. And I draw this out very fully in the paper with lots of quotations, because the claim by the UP is that new decade, new approach was the basis. They went back into government along with the other parties in January 2020. They claim that a big promise in that was not implemented. Namely, that there would be unfettered access for goods going from GB to NI. Now, that, I've never seen that question put to UK ministers. 
to say, well, what did you mean by the words that are there? There are words that are interpreted on that basis, that they're delphic words in my reading of them. The question that's not, 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 not been put is, what did you mean, O oh, UK ministers? If if they answer, if they say yes, we agree with the DUP. That, that that's what that promise is. That's a direct contradiction of the protocol, and a direct contradiction of the, the prime minister's letter and of the command paper of May of 2020. If on the other hand they say, well, yes, uh, no, that we didn't make that promise to the DUP, then why haven't they said so? Why why every time in Parliament that's the lead argument that is brought forward? Why does no one say actually? Sorry, that's not what it means. Uh, so all of that is about clarity and candor. I, I'm, I'm not, not commenting on the merit of the choices that are being made here. I'm, I'm commenting on the fact that, that misleading, contradictory statements are made. So furthermore, um, there was a very clear agreement in October 2019 that there would be no, no group would have a veto on the, the agreement. So the consent mechanism, as discussed, was not on a cross-community basis. It was recognized that cross-community agreement was highly desirable, but clear recognition that it was not essential. Uh, very, very interestingly, in the UK's declaration on the consent mechanism, they said, if in 2024, there is no cross-community support for continuation of the protocol, we will commission an independent review and examine the facts, exact, take views from business, from civic society, from the political leaders in the land, and see what could be done to secure cross community support. So, um, just in passing, then, uh, one word in the bill that str I struggle with uh, at the more technical operational level is this word destined. So, the, the Bill talks about goods being destined to stay in Northern Ireland. Well, <laughs> yes, by all means, to, to the extent that works, that's great. Uh, you know, um, the, the green red, green channel, red channel concept is um, well worth pursuing and should get, get as much weight as possible, but if goods are in free circulation in Northern Ireland, then you don't know where they're destined for. That's if, if that wasn't a problem, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have had to go through the journey of these last number of years. That if, the, if the problem was that easy to solve, it would have been solved, and it's not. So I, I wrote a paper about channels in um, March of 2018, and it was came out of a meeting with the task force where they were very clear that they would not have any risk tolerance in relation to the health related aspects of controls. And of course that links to the fact that there have been controls on protect health, animal health and plant health going back to 1847. That's not, it's not new. So it can't be unconstitutional. Uh, it's established fact uh, and uh, that's why in the paper I wrote and in uh, the Prime Minister's letter of October 2019, it was the basis of the idea was to protect the island of Ireland as a single epidemiological unit. That's at the heart of, of that's the, definitely the most difficult part of the application of the protocol uh, and the reason for the long grace periods is because of the complexity arising from that, but the, the scale and the challenge of that issue was well known, well established in 2020, and the government knew about that and said in, in December 2020 that three months was enough. Some supermarkets are ready, and the rest have said they will be ready. Within six weeks of that, they were saying something completely different. Um, I wonder what happened in the meantime, Ted. <laughs> um, so it's, it's essentially all about getting to, to the facts, finding a way ahead, framed by the facts. Uh, I, I think 
there are very clear arguments that the protocol bill, far from defending the agreement, reverts to an imposed solution based on the views of one side, rather than seeking consent, seeking a seeking agreement. And so, come back to my first two points: an inclusive <clears throat> process would be better. Having things done to you, Northern Ireland politicians, rather than with their engagement, finding a way for that to happen is surely worth thinking about. Independent review is not an original concept. Indeed, someone says it's tired and exhausted and it's been tried too many times before. Um, but um, it's in the UK government document, as I said, in a different context, but, but why not apply it? And um, what better ideas are there around? Okay, if, if, if the current talks lead to agreement, and that's something that can be accepted, great. But the protocol bill sets an incredibly high bar uh, to uh, for those talks, and that, that's why I see great difficulty. But actually, the final point is just that whatever about the way ahead, it requires leadership. It requires, um, I think, back to the, the, the 90s when in leaders in Northern Ireland and elsewhere, including here and uh, in the Irish government and in the US and in the EU, gave and created a vision and worked together positively with a long term strategic view. And I would um, honour those who, who led the process uh, John Hume, David Trimble, and, and many others uh, who got us to the agreement. So learning from how we got there matters as we find a way forward. Great, thank okay. you very much, Andrew. And I'm gonna hand over directly now to Katie Hayward, who has been a, a very present commentator on these events since 2016. Um, and a very well known in Northern Ireland. We're so delighted to have her with us this evening. So Katie, over to you for, I think, about 10 minutes. Is that okay? Yes, it's, it's great. Please notify me if I'm running over. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much to Barry and to you, David, for the uh, invitation. It's an honour to be in this college. And it's a particular honour to be on a panel with Andrew, who um, about whom could not be said enough in terms of the difference that he made um, behind the scenes at a really critical moment, not just um, for Northern Ireland, but for UK-EU relations and indeed for British-Irish relations. And um, Andrew has very kindly participated in a Brexit witness interview uh, that will be going on the archives. A small part of that is available for you to see in the UK and the Changing Europe website. And I'd really encourage you to read it because as you've seen already, um, not only your experience, Andrew, but your insights and analysis are second to none. And um, it's, a, it's an honor to respond to some of your remarks uh, this evening. Um, so these are very, what I really wanted to pick up on is the question of consent and consensus. I think starting from your initial remarks with respect to um, the comments around this whole process needing to be as inclusive as possible. So just some reflections on that really. Um, why not begin at the beginning? And that is in relation to the impact of Brexit on ideology and identity in the very peculiar and particular place of Northern Ireland. Um, and what did that mean? So fundamentally, of course, it disrupts the context and many of the assumptions behind the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. We all know that. But perhaps it's worth reflecting on the ways it does that in particular. So one is, of course, in relation to the salience of borders, coming right back to the forefront, both in ideology, ideological terms and practical terms. And just as an aside, I went to Paddy Cailty's Borderlines show in the lyric the other day, and uh, he said he began his um, set by basically saying, a hundred years ago, the English drew a border across the island of Ireland and annoyed, it wasn't the word he used, annoyed all the Catholics. And then a hundred years later, they drew one down the Irish Sea and annoyed all the Protestants. Mm -hmm. And so now we've got two borders to deal with. Um, anyway, that better very succinctly, and I'll move on to my next point, which is, of course, um, the um, exacerbation and anticipation of UK-EU divergence. That's at the heart of the Brexit process as well, of course. And of course, therefore, it disrupts the Good Friday Belfast Agreement and the assumptions 
that are made behind that. Um, also, of course, into the Brexit process, we have a zero sum analysis, a win lose analysis, competitive discourses um, in those in those ways, which of course is extremely unhelpful in a peace process where you're wanting to get away from that binary zero sum analysis. Um, such zero sum analysis came, let's be forget, in relation to defining the problem itself and the consequences of the decision, the consequences of, um, of Brexit itself. And then not just the denial of the problems and the challenges and confusion around that, making facts um, sort of put counter to each other and therefore experiences and perceptions counter to each other, but also denial of the solutions as well and their consequences. And basically the fact that um, there are difficult decisions to have to be made here and there are difficult consequences to deal with. Another impact of Brexit, of course, that is extremely unhelpful for the context of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement is the constitutional uncertainty put into the heart of the United Kingdom. And I'm not just talking about the relationship between uh, evolved regions and nations, um, I'm conscious of Mike Kenny here and your fantastic project on the constitutional future, constitutional future of the UK, but also constitutional uncertainty at the heart of the UK's constitution in other ways, including the role of officials, for example, or indeed the role of the rule of law. And also compounding all of this is the exclusion, as has already been mentioned, of Northern Ireland's um, elected representatives and institutions in managing the fallout from all of this. Um, and as I sort of alluded to, those behind the scenes, particularly officials, played such a crucial part in trying to keep things um, as level as possible, trying to prepare for just extraordinary circumstances, um, such as a no deal withdrawal agreement, such as a no deal um, TCA. So bearing all that in mind, and I just want to reflect then on the challenges for any, for where we are now, given all that that has meant for the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. And if we're all agreed that Jonathan Stevens and others are right, that's what's, that what is necessary in Northern Ireland is a process that is as inclusive as possible, that does command confidence across the different community divides um, and indeed connections. Um, how, you know, what does all this, what does all of this mean? I think one small challenge is of course that the decision to exclude oneself is a very effective tool in the present day. And um, the fact that it can uh, completely undermine and suspend the operation of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement is something that does need to be uh, considered in all of this. However, looking ahead, where we are at the moment, and we see this from polling that my colleague David Finnemore and I conduct in Queens, um, it's a very worrying situation. Um, so we see now, for example, one of the headline findings is that um, 30 percent of our respondents, so there's a margin of error of 2.3 percent plus or minus, 30 percent of our respondents uh, say that the Northern Ireland executive should not be reformed until the protocol is scrapped. So bearing in mind that the protocol being scrapped is really not on the cards, the UK government isn't saying that, the EU is, isn't saying that. This presents a profound challenge, therefore, to the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. And more to the point, it suggests that um, there's an erosion, there's an erosion happening, not just in relation to trust in the UK government, et cetera, but also of confidence in the institutions themselves, and indeed the purpose of those Good Friday Belfast Agreement institutions. Um, so just to reflect a wee bit on what consent and consensus might mean in this context. First and foremost, consent in the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, and I know um, this is subject of some debate, but essentially if you read, read the text, um, consent in that is in relation to majority votes. So majority will, with as expressed through a referendum with regards to whether Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom or a United Ireland. So that's quite clear. That's what consent means. And that's what's been there even, uh, you know, for, for decades now, even pre-Anglo-Irish agreement about the principle of majority consent in Northern Ireland for its constitutional 
situation. Um, and uh, but what we have in the in Article 18 in the protocol is a reworking of that idea, uh, as Andrew's explained a wee bit. Um, and the purpose of that article, according to the text, is to provide the opportunity for democratic consent in Northern Ireland. And as we know, that does a, that that is a is a reworking of it, of this idea of consent, in that it's specifically about Articles five to ten. And uh, if there's a majority vote in amongst the um, MLAs themselves against that, um, those Articles five to ten continue to apply. Then it goes back to negotiation. If the majority vote in favour, then they continue to be operating cross community for four years. If it's on the basis of cross community consent, operating for eight years. Okay, that's all well and good. This is a new definition of consent, not because it's bringing in the principle of majorities. Um, partly because it's making it more complex, but also partly because it's about the MLAs themselves as a constituency. If you look at the unilateral declaration that the UK government um, put forward um, it, it, alongside Article 18, there's, it's much more ambitious in that regard, as Andrew's already said. So the objective of Article 18, as the UK government sees it, is to seek and achieve um, agreement that is as broad as possible in Northern Ireland and where possible through a process um, that is taken forward and supported by a power sharing executive in Northern Ireland. And interestingly enough, the UK government said it would have a process in advance of such a, a consent vote in the Northern Ireland Assembly that would reach out to uh, the electorate in many ways that would include civil society, etc. So that they would participate so in a sense, trying to get social consent and consensus for the protocol before the MLAs have that particular vote, which is quite interesting. Um, however, by the time of uh, um, July 2021 and the UK government's command paper, Article 18 was being rethought in a certain way. So, for example, it was talking about um, uh, the electorate in Northern Ireland would have their say over the protocol um, because of Article 18. So essentially, very directly saying that this protocol is actually an electoral issue and you can vote according to um, your views on Article 8, um, five, Articles 5 to 10 in the protocol. <clears throat> you give me up with me. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Um, and in our polling, we've seen just quite how divisive that is and how people seem to, to get that. Um, and there is a slight majority in favour of their MLAs voting in favour of Articles 5 to 10. Um, but it's not an overwhelming one. Uh, it's low 50s. And the majority of people say their MLA's position on the protocol influences whether they vote for them. Or not. So, so in that way, it's been quite successful. Um, but however... Naming it as an electoral issue came on top of the UK government um, uh, creating an environment in which it was bound to be extremely divisive. So as Andrew says in his paper, um, in putting out the protocol early on, they didn't listen to the problems that were raised from businesses and others. And just as an aside, just to note, the Northern Ireland Business Brexit Working Group, for example, was formed in late 2019, early 2020. And they, they were submitting in detail the problems with the with the protocol and the issues that it that it might mean. Um, and many of us indeed were, were writing about it at the time. Um, so far from being champions of the protocol or being un, unquestioning of its um, benefits, um, many of us were sort of outlining the difficulties right from the beginning. Not only were they ignored, um, those concerns weren't addressed, the grace periods weren't long enough, for example, but more to the point, there was not inclusion yet of stakeholders, there wasn't proper engagement with the stakeholders to recognise, or indeed substantial engagement with officials to recognise what the difficulties might be, and therefore to try and create an environment in which those concerns could be addressed. Um, so the operation of the protocol, such as it has been over the last two years, has been in a context in which the, the, the problems of the protocol have been exacerbated. 
um, for various reasons by the British government. Um, and of course, therefore, this has had an effect of deepening concerns among some communities in Northern Ireland and polarizing the debate in Northern Ireland. Um, so the next steps. I think it's not too late to ask the question, um, where is, where's the solid ground? Um, and to get right to the point of the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, um, the UK government is saying that it wants a UK EU agreement to have the same outcomes as the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. That's simply not possible. Um, and partly because the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill is another example of the UK government wanting to have its cake and eat it and denying the difficulties of the decisions that have to be made. And we'll be happy to talk about the details <laughs> in terms of green red or in terms of dual regulatory regime, whatever. But th th at the moment, the way that the Protocol Bill is presented is simply not realizable. It's not realistic at all. Um, and so, and for other matters as well, any UK EU agreement, which we would hope to come to, which we could come to, cannot have the same objectives and outcomes. If we are to get to a situation in which such an agreement would be realizable and then indeed be sellable, and even beyond that, begin to command some confidence amongst even strong unionists. We have to begin now in terms of the way that the UK government talks about uh, the challenges and indeed the capacity of the protocol bill. And I think a starting point would, it, would be for it to begin to recognize that unilateral action on the protocol in the form of the protocol bill sits very uncomfortably with the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, not least because it's coming in objection to 52 of the 90 MLAs um, and not least because it comes with the strong objections from the Irish government. Um, so that, that would be a starting point in terms of solid ground. And um, I look forward to hearing what David has to say. Thank you very much, David. Wonderful. Great, we'll hand directly over to you, David. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for the opportunity to have this discussion in this historic surroundings. 1473, you said? 1473, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when was Trinity founded? No, <laughs> hundred years later. Um, uh, and uh, also, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you for the work you do on on UK Irish relations. Um, I think this is something on which we're going to have to work very hard in the years to come, because Brexit, frankly, has driven a stake through the heart of otherwise excellent relations between the UK and Ireland, um, and has the capacity, frankly, as we as we as we have seen, to to poison those relations. And the fact that we will not have the regular meetings between British and Irish ministers in Brussels, in the margins of the, the council meetings and so on, we have to find a, an alternative mechanism for keeping that dialogue going. Uh, and certainly in the Institute for International and, and European Affairs in Dublin, we're very committed to this. We'd be glad to have with us uh, to be joined by Dahir Kelly, who's chairman of our UK Ireland Working Group. Uh, former uh, Irish ambassador uh, here in, in, in London, Blair Horan, who is a member of that group, a very distinguished uh, trade unionist, uh, who is very active in this area and has been active uh, in this before. So we're very committed to, to working and delighted to have the opportunity to cooperate with, with what you're doing here in Cambridge. Secondly, uh, just to echo what Katie said about Andrew, Andrew, you know, your, your ears will be burning. Um, I, I think Andrew does fantastic work. I, I, you've heard the quality of his analysis tonight. Uh, it is thoughtful, it is well-researched, it is calm, uh, and, and he tries to just bring people back to confront the realities, uh, not always popular with different uh, factions in, in the discussion, but I think his, his work has been absolutely remarkable. I mean, I'm, I'm, I didn't know him when he was a civil servant in Northern Ireland, and, and I'm sure Katie is right, but I have seen his work since then, and we were delighted to be able to publish uh, you know, his latest paper. Uh, which I think is, is a huge contribution. And by the way, when someone writes the history of all this, I think some of the stuff that uh, Andrew has written will be a, a, a very valuable source. Um, <clears throat> well, everything has been said, but not quite yet by everybody. Uh, so I will, I will try to keep my remarks mainly to 
uh, a kind of EU perspective on some of this, because I think that given my background, because not only you know, did I have the, the many tasks that Barry has mentioned, I was also Director General for Trade. So I actually know something about customs union. I know something about goods tra tra going across borders. Uh, and I know how the EU perceives these issues. Um, the tragedy of the situation we're in is this, this was utterly predictable. Uh, Brexit was going to produce this outcome unless managed very, very carefully. And it was not managed carefully because there was no plan. Um, and Brexit was, I mean, I, I leave aside what people in the room may think of this as, as British people seen from outside was an egregious act of self-harm by the UK on itself. But unfortunately, and, and this is less forgivable, it was also an, an egregious act of harm on your neighbors and particularly on Ireland. Uh, and this was always going to be a major problem in Northern Ireland. And everyone who, who looked at this problem saw it immediately. Uh, Tony Blair and John Major, I must say to the great credit, raised it during the referendum. They were poo-pooed and ignored, but they were absolutely right. And they were absolutely right that sooner or later, this would damage the Good Friday Agreement. Not because it was inherently linked to joint membership of the EU, but because the, the tensions which Brexit was inevitably going to create on, on, on the island of Ireland about where you put a new border, because it brought the border back into the debate. We had got rid of the border. The Good Friday Agreement effectively buried the debate about a border because on the one hand, the unionists had the constitutional guarantee that Northern Ireland would be part of the United Kingdom. The Irish changed their constitution to remove the constitutional claim. So for the first time, Northern Ireland was a recognized entity and had a legal, a legal status. On the other hand, if you were a nationalist, because we were both in, in the EU, you could pretend you were living on a United Ireland, right? You, you, you could drive around the island, you could work, you could play, you could, you could move. The only thing, as somebody I think said, the only thing you knew when you crossed the, front, crossed the border was a, a ping on your phone to say you changed a phone provider. And that was, that was it. Uh, and so we could, we'd taken the border to a certain extent out of, of the Irish debate. Brexit brought it right back in, where there had to be a border. And I do think it's very important to understand because sometimes people say to me, well, why does it have to be a border? I mean, when you leave the European Union, you create a border. There has to be a border at Calais and at Dover. How can there have to be a border at Calais and at Dover and not, the, not be one in Ireland, on Ireland, around Ireland? You, you had to find a, a solution. To the border. We spent four years discussing what, this, what form this would take because we all agreed and everyone agreed from the very beginning that recreating a hard border on the island of Ireland was impossible. Leave aside threats of violence or anything, just materially and physically putting customs posts, having checks on a border which is anyway porous, utterly porous, that was not gonna work. It would also create security problems and so on, but it just, everyone agreed. The, the British government, the Irish government, uh, even people in Northern Ireland were saying, yes, a hard border with a very few exceptions, a hard border on the island of Ireland is not the option. So what was your other option? The only other option was some kind of uh, uh, checks. I don't even like to use the word border because it's not a border, but some kind of checks on trade between uh, GB and, and Northern Ireland. Four years of work. Uh, Theresa May initially went for uh, something like checks on uh, goods going into Northern Ireland. She was told by the DUP in no uncertain terms this wouldn't work. She changed her mind and she went for what was still the best deal ever on offer for the UK, which was her, her package to keep the UK as a whole in the customs union, unless the trade agreement, the future trade agreement, removed the, the, the necessity for that. So that was why it was called a backstop, because it was hoped that the trade deal would eliminate this problem. I don't think many of us thought it could, but that was the hope. But anyway, there was a guarantee that if the trade deal did not fix the problem, there would be some kind of, that the UK as a whole would remain in the customs union, reducing the, the risk of having to create any kind of border around Ireland. That was rejected, rejected also by the DUP, uh, but more particularly by, by Boris Johnson. And when he, won the, when he came to power, he decided he wanted to get Brexit done. The protocol as we know it today was designed in 10 Downing Street. That is how the EU sees it. I mean, yes, we, we negotiated it jointly and every line in that protocol was negotiated with British and EU officials. Everybody knew what they were signing up to, which was that there would have to be checks uh, on goods traveling between GB and Northern Ireland. There was debate about exactly the nature of the checks, whether you could house, how, how, 
how invasive they would be, how you could find ways of reducing them. And this is why the implementation was delegated to a joint working group uh, to, be, to be worked out. A huge opportunity was lost when the protocol was agreed, just after 2020. If we had engaged the UK and the EU at that point, in my view, we could, as Katie said, have figured out talking to the local communities, talking to businesses, we could have found a way of addressing what were going to be very real problems. Don't get me wrong. People in Northern Ireland are not wrong to say there are issues with the protocol. When I first heard that this solution, which was that Northern Ireland remains integrally part of the single market for goods and the UK single market, I said, as a trade negotiator, I've never seen, this is a creature I've never seen before. It doesn't exist anywhere in the world. So creativity and innov innovation was going to be necessary to make this work, but it could be made work. But the British government almost immediately withdrew from the process and declined to engage because clearly they were having second thoughts about the whole business and seen from an EU point of view, they have been guilty of bad faith consistently since then, starting with the internal market bill, which began to sort of unravel the protocol, and then with the utterly, frankly, you know, utterly illegal and, and outrageous uh, Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, which is a complete negation of the deal which the UK signed and ratified and applauded with the EU. So seen from the point of view of the 27 member states, and I even take, take Ireland out, and I just say the 26 member states, the UK has acted consistently in bad faith throughout this entire process. And that's part of the problem, because now we want to try and solve it, and we have to solve it. Uh, there's a lot of distrust in the system. At the same time, enormous damage was done to the fabric of the Good Friday Agreement because we started messing with these debates about consent and, and uh, association. To be very clear, from the EU perspective, they would have negotiated with anyone. They would have been perfectly happy if representatives of the Northern Ireland uh, executive had been, or, or, or MLAs or whatever, were present in the room. They would have had no problem. It's, but it's up to the British government to decide who was brought into the process. And they consistently said, this is Westminster business, not Stormont business. And that was the answer. And that's why it was negotiated. And I agree, we have to remedy that. Uh, it was done without really real engagement with the people who ultimately were gonna be most affected by this. How do we now fix this? Well, and of course, sorry, a final point. Uh, then we had the, the, the contamination of the, the Good Friday Agreement, the ultimate contamination when the DUP decided uh, to, to use their entitlement to refuse to join the executive uh, in, in order to demonstrate their, their opposition. Uh, as Andrew pointed out, we just need to note, I'm trying to avoid making cheap points, but it has to be said that in the beginning, the DUP sort of said, we think we can work with this and actually applauded the whole deal and said it was a great deal. Then uh, encouraged, I think, by the British government, again, an act of bad faith, they, just, they, they, they progressively uh, hyped up their opposition and 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 you know have now reached a point where they're saying it has to be scrapped. And this, I mean, just, just to be clear, Sinn Fein withdrew from the executive for three years. So I mean, you know, it's it's not a tactic that the DUP invented. Uh, I, one can have criticism about it because ultimately, where does it lead you? But I mean, we have to acknowledge that this is, you know, as Katie said, this is part of the process, and and it demonstrates that there is a there, there's an issue in Northern Ireland that has to be addressed. In my view, a deal is possible uh, between the UK and and the EU. I see straws in the wind that such a deal might happen. Uh, I honestly don't know. I'm not privy to any of the the, the, the the talks that are going on. There are cautiously optimistic noises. The deal is fairly easy to write. Uh, any of us who deal with trade issues, we could write it in, in an afternoon. Um, but it will, and it will basically involve uh, the EU proposals from October of uh, last year, um, considerably reducing the, the, the checks, uh, <clears throat> we can certainly have some kind of express lane, not necessarily a green or red lane. We can call it green or red if that makes everybody happy. Uh, the, the issue, as as Andrew says, of goods destined, how do you guarantee, uh, you know, truckloads of stuff coming to a supermarket from Tesco or, or Marks and Sparks? Yes, th th there are things that can be done. Um, there are issues around the health and safety, uh, the phytosanitary issues, which the EU is extremely tough on. And by the way, with justification. 
the, the history of British customs in this, uh, this area, even as an EU member, was never was not perfect. So there are real issues there. We could solve it with a veterinary agreement, which for ideological reasons the UK is not prepared to do. But OK, we can still, in my view, make a lot of progress on those technical issues. We can iron out a lot of the problems that Northern Ireland business has identified. Uh, and the EU has already, Marcus Sefcovic has been in Northern Ireland a lot of times, talked to people. The EU, is, is, in my view, has ideas about how we can make this protocol work more smoothly. But it cannot be eliminated. Uh, equally, on some of the more contentious issues like VAT, energy, um, uh, state aids, and the most vexed issue, I mean, most vexed, hardly the most important, frankly, but the most politically ideological of the Court of Justice, in my view, words can be found. Words can be found which soften some of the, some of the issues. So we can, I could imagine, without too much difficulty, a protocol 2.0, which could be agreed, but it's going to be a long way short of the protocol bit. Now, I'm sure the British government can sell that to their own parliament. How do they sell that to the DUP? And therein, in my view, lies the, the, the biggest problem, uh, because they, they have walked the DUP troops right up to the top of the hill, and they're going to have to talk them down again. And honestly, this is not easy. And that's why I just had to come to my final, my, my final one comment. Minute, one minute, Davis. Yes. Okay. Yeah. One, one yes. No, 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 I'm, I'm just about to finish, um, which is we have to listen to the voices of unionism and loyalism in Northern Ireland. I was at the British and Irish Council, uh, sorry, British Irish Association, not the council. Uh, I think you were there, Andrew, Katie, you were there. We heard several of the unionists say, you're just not listening to us. You're just not listening to us. So we have to, I mean, I do understand their perspective. I understand why they don't like the protocol. If I were a unionist, I would be upset at this protocol. But, and so we have to, but we have to find ways of talking to them, of listening to them, and more generally, on, on the note of relations in this island, collectively, we must not do to the unionists what they did, what they did to the nationalists in, 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 19, in 1922. Uh, if ever we're moving in, the, I don't know whether we're moving towards a direct United Ireland or whatever, whatever relationship we're going to have, we have to find ways of listening to and respecting this substantial body of opinion in Northern Ireland, which is sometimes contradictory, which sometimes takes ridiculous positions. But the fact is, they have their fears and they have their concerns, and we have to find ways of bringing them into this discussion, and rebuilding the, the Good Friday Agreement, uh, or I'm not saying renegotiate, I'm not an expert on it, but finding ways of making that work better. Uh, but firstly, we have to try and solve this protocol problem, because frankly, and this is my absolute last point, we have bigger issues between the UK and the EU, which require us to take this particular piece of poison out of the equation. And then we're going to look, uh, look at other issues between the UK and the EU in the years to come, because given all that's going on in Europe at the moment, uh, in the grand scheme of things, we cannot let this issue poison uh, the, the, the broader relations. I think that was slightly more than one minute. I apologize. Thanks. Slightly more, but we'll forgive you. Okay, thank you very much, David. Um, Andrew, I'd like to come back to you for maybe five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a, a, a wonderful moment in uh, Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy, where Smiley is trying to identify the mole. Um, Toby Esther has his uh, is, is you know I'm sure if he's soldier or is, is in the in the name somewhere in, the, in that in that plot. But he's an art dealer. And Smiley says to him, do you ever buy a fake? And Toby says, well, I sold a few. <laughs> the question is, who's, who, who is, is fooling who in this context? Uh, you could argue that the DUP bought a fake. Or you could argue, actually, in October 19, that the EU bought a fake. I don't know, because actually pinning down what the UK government actually means and what it's trying to do is that's that's the the stage of the plot I'm at in this unfolding um spy thriller. Um, <laughs> but, but seriously, so just to characterize the, the points based on, on the fact that the hard border issue uh did emerge very quickly and it actually was in as someone said on Twitter not a week or two ago it was in the letter that Arlene Foster and Martin McGuinness signed in July of 2016. So that, that was a moment of triumph for someone who said, I see, even the DUP recognized that the hard border issue was a big problem. True. But important point of context of that is that in, at that time, 
we didn't know that the UK was going to leave the single market, and therefore we didn't know the scale of the problem, and therefore the hard border on the on the island of Ireland issue, which is very very real, and I I, I agree with the word impossible that they were used. It had done you know several laps of the course before the fact that there would be an issue about the sea border even emerged. And that's that's I think part of the the dynamic of the thing, and that that links the two. Uh, I'm going to make some some derogatory comments about both governments now. Right. So. UK government, uh, two words are denial and carelessness. So failing to accept the consequences of, of Brexit and the fact, as, as Katie said, that there are that Brexit means means borders. And in fact, they said we're, we're going to take back control of our borders was a bit of a clue. Um, but the actual, even today, that's not worked out for the UK as a whole. The Irish, Irish government was at the other extreme. So even before the referendum, I, part of my job was to travel. And if I visited an Irish consulate anywhere, the first question was, are you ready? Have you thought through the implications of Brexit? So the, the, the uh, indeed, I think it's uh, been commented by our, my good friend, Rory Montgomery, that actually the Irish arguments were so well marshaled and so well developed, they, it arguably overachieved. We look at, at the autumn of 2017, leading to the joint report, on which more another time. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And maybe even in 2019, in the world conversation, was that too successful? Now, sorry, how can how can you criticize? Going back to something David said, how can you criticize them for looking after their own interests? And they did, and they did did it very very effectively, and with some very, very strong and legitimate arguments, but there's been an imbalance, an imbalance of understanding uh, and therefore something missing in the union, especially unionist engagement, unionist involvement, especially when you have contradictory stories being told by the Prime Minister, indeed I would, I would put um, Michael Gove also saying things that suited at a, at a time and a context, which then turn out actually do not stand up. So uh, that, those are just reflections back as to think the, the things that came to mind as Katie and David were talking. So uh, I look forward to the, the denouement uh, when actually uh, things come through, but, but that, that's what we have to all apply our thoughts and minds to is how to work out a credible fact-based way forward that moves from um, fakery, from denial, from over-anxiety and over-achievement into constructive resolution. Great. Great. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you to our wonderful panel. We're now going to have uh, the Q&A session, so please get your thinking caps on you and think of some questions to ask our panellists, but also some coming in from the online audience as well. But I'm going to abuse my position as chair uh, and ask each of you a question to begin with. Um, please be as brief as you can in your responses so we can get through everybody in, in the room. I want to pick up on your last point, Andrew, um, about the Irish government. How far do you think that the Irish government pushed strand two of the Good Friday Agreement, North-South relations, to the detriment of what's now being reframed as East-West relations in the current discourse over the agreement? Um, well, I, I, they, they pushed it very hard and very well. Uh, I don't think deliberately to the detriment. It, 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 again, it's Rory who said that the, the assumption was that the UK would make the arguments they needed to make to, to balance them off. So there's an assumption of you know a a working dialectic, as it were. That 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 uh, didn't happen. So my, my vivid memory of the autumn of 2017 uh, was uh, I, I wasn't in executive office at the time, saying to, to the colleagues who are working on the the so-called north-south mapping exercise. What's this all about? Why, why, why is this happening? It became clear when the draft text appeared, which was all demonstrating the significance of EU membership for north-south relations. And that's still reflected in the protocol. Part of the protocol is there to protect north-south cooperation, which of course is at the very, very heart of the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, constitutional change was conditional on the creation of the North-South institutions. The trade was 
constitution for institutions. That's the whole mm -hmm. journey of the 1990s. So mm -hmm. it was genuinely very important uh, that, that there was a, a, a slow recognition uh, that the east the east west trade issue would be difficult. Uh, even in 2019, uh, if you read the tone of what the prime minister sent to President Juncker, that's selling something that, that appears to be saleable. The assumption was this would work. So uh, that's, my, that's my interpretation. I don't go with those who say they were always deliberately, consciously you know, doing the wrong thing. My, my reading is that is that they signed up to the protocol on the basis that if this works, then fine, we're good. And if it doesn't, well, we'll just tear it and start again. Great, thank you. Um, Katie, uh, really enjoyed your contribution as well. Um, and maybe you might expand on us the sort of hint that you gave us saying that the UK government wants a UK EU agreement to have the same outcome as the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. Fundamentally, you felt that was not realizable. I was wondering if you might expand a little bit more on, on that for us. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Steve. Um, just before I do, if I could just follow up just what Andrew was saying. So that argument about the North South versus East West, I mean, a lot of that context, if we recall, was around trying to encourage the UK towards a soft Brexit, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, an awful lot of the consequences of the protocol, obviously, is around, as has already been alluded to, kind of the hard Brexit. So we mustn't lose sight of that, I think. Um, yes, so the protocol bill, so essentially um, uh, excluding provisions of the Northern Ireland Protocol to effectively minimize the checks and controls in the Irish Sea border, um, um, to be able to say that they've taken away the Irish Sea border, um, removing the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, um, at the same time as protecting Article 2 of the protocol in relation to non diminution of rights and such things as a single electricity market. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, the reason I'm saying it's a sort of um, have your cake and eat it is because all of these things go together. Also the state aid and VAT, et cetera. Um, and it's essentially trying to imagine that the EU will allow, or enable the UK government to rework its single market um, unilaterally. <laughs> um, so, um, we had a lot of this in the whole Brexit process, of course, um, about which bits you can uh, take and leave of EU membership. For example, the original position being about minimizing or stopping EU immigration, but still being able to have free movement of goods. So I think that's good. That's happening a lot. I think fundamentally, though, um, even UK officials, I'm not sure whether they'd say this publicly, but the, obviously recognizing even for green and red channels to operate, you will need to have some checks and controls. Most particularly, you'll need to have border control posts in place mm -hmm. to be able to make sure operate the red channel in the first instance, and also to um, have intelligence um, led or risk based um, checks on green channel movements as well. So that's a that's a key point um, that has never been addressed. So there's something fundamental around, if we're getting to that point of fact-based discussion, to be able to say, actually, any working of even this dream scenario of the protocol bill operating, you'll still need to have these things in place. You'll still need to have border control post bill. Um, so I, I think um, as long as the discussion of the bill, and I know there's been intense discussion of it, but as long as the presentation of it is still to emphasize um, this idea that the DUP seven points will be met in some ways, um, although they can be very broadly interpreted, is um, it's dangerous. So the DUP seven point plan that is outlined. Uh, so yes, back and the tests, the tests, the tests. yeah, um, which are very ambitious. Um, and I think what we're long missing is, um, a sort, as I say, a, a sort of a reality check on what's possible, <laughs> most particularly given the consequences of the protocol bill. Specifically in relation to the role for the Court of Justice of the EU. Thank you, Katie. Um, David, um, drawing on your former experience uh, of working in trade, I want to ask a, a sort of devil's advocate like question. Um, and you, you really made clear about how important it was to ensure that 
foods are properly policed and controlled as they cross over to Northern Ireland. But I want to ask about the flip side of where that border might be, somewhere like Albania, for example. Is the EU as rigorous in all of its borders as it's currently trying to be in, in Northern Ireland? Yeah. Yes, actually. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean I'm probably with, you know, with flaws, with, 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 with issues, mm -hmm. but uh, the EU is, you know, customs control is, is one area where the EU is pretty rigorous uh, and sets high standards. Uh, and that is not an area where people are prepared to compromise. And you need to understand, this is not the commission. It's not bureaucrats in Brussels. It's the member states who are absolutely determined that they will not allow a situation where there is a gaping hole in our customs and checks. And it's all very well to say, oh, trade north-south is, is minuscule. Trade, you know, GB to, to Northern Ireland is minuscule. Of course, it's minuscule at the moment. The minute smugglers and organized crime discover that there is a loophole, I can assure you the issues will be uh, of, of, of an industrial scale. Because it's not just about the, the current trade, it's about how that trade could develop if it's not properly controlled and monitored. Uh, and, and that is why the, the big issue, which has been a debate, is about access to real-time data, mm -hmm. which was an integral part which would give the EU customs officials access to real-time data so that you would know exactly what was getting on a, a, a ferry in, 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 in Scotland or in, in England and moving to Northern Ireland. You'd have several hours in which time you could check what are these products, where are they coming from, what do we know, are there risks, oh, we've suddenly seen a massive increase in this kind of trade. That offers opportunities and that has been something which the UK government has denied to the EU officials for the last two years. I gather it's on the verge of a breakthrough, and that is a game changer in terms of how the checks which are required. But to answer your question, yes, we I'm not saying there are not weaknesses you know, to be found elsewhere in the system, but uh, in, we invest heavily in, in not only about customs controls, but also in verifying customs control. Mm -hmm. okay, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, great. And I'd like to open up to the floor. If you have plenty of hands, could be Professor Richard Burke, good evening, first of all. Oh, and might I just say, sorry, whenever you are about to ask a question, please do just introduce yourself briefly and your affiliation and try to keep your questions as brief as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Richard Burke, University of Cambridge, and I will be brief. Um, Andrew, you, you mentioned um, leadership and its importance. Uh, one figure in particular um, in the politics of this country is associated with subcompute and willful uh, prestidigitation. Um, will the departure of Johnson make a difference to British government's um, negotiating expectations? Well, well that depends. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's optimism. There, 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 yes, there's yeah. hope, there's, there's hope, but it, it, the you know, proof of pudding will be in whether whether uh, the current prime minister and the government face up to the implications of what they've agreed. And, and work out work on the basis of of what is actually possible, uh, rather than uh, ideology and 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 pre preordained positions. Uh, that, that's to be to be proven. Um, we shouldn't have too long to wait. Great. Um, yourself, please. Um, please post that with the financial times newspaper. Um, it's been a two volume bit of talking about our FBS, which Andrew alluded to earlier in the day. On FBS, um, David alluded to the data sharing agreement, which is supposed to be almost an hour on both sides of going through now. To what extent would that data sharing arrangement, if it was agreed, allow the Commission to take a risk based, a more risk based approach to titanium dioxide and partnership? Just that sort of bit, bearing in mind the parameters that they set out. And on the ECJ question, I'm into the day because I'm sure that Sunak can sell that to his party. I'd be surprised, you know, I agree that Frost chucked that in late in the July command day. It's never an issue in 2020. That was all about consent. But nonetheless, I have two questions on that. One is, does the panel really think that the ECJ and the Sunak is strong enough physically to get the ERG? To follow the ECJ pill, the formal words that David mentioned. And is it correct what we're always told in merry old England, people like me, that the EUP don't really care about the ECJ question? Is that correct? 
Who would like to answer that? Well, that maybe I'll, I'll just take um, on the risk-based approach. Yes, the the access to real-time data reduces the, the the checks which could be necessary. It doesn't eliminate them, but it reduces them because it enables you to have a more surgical uh, picture of the, the trade on an sort of hourly basis, which enables you better to identify anomalies and risks. It doesn't eliminate on, on, the, on the health and, and safety side, there will still have to be checks, but the, the, the objective is you can reduce them considerably uh, uh, and, and, and make them, I would say, generally palatable and, 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 and relatively inobtrusive to uh, people in all and up to everyday business and, and so on. So it does make a difference. I didn't say, I mean, sorry, I did say that I, by definition, I suppose if Sunak signs an agreement, he thinks he can sell it. That's what I meant. I, I'm, I'm not saying what, what he can, what he thinks he can and cannot do. I'm simply saying if there is a deal between the EU and the UK, I'm assuming that the, the person who signs that deal, namely the prime minister, signs off on that deal, the prime minister feels he can bring with him his party. My point is, it's I think he has a much more difficult challenge with selling it to, to the DUP, who have taken an even more radical view of, 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 of what has to be done to the protocol for it to be acceptable to them. But whether the Prime Minister feels he is in a position on the ECJ to accept a form of words which emphasizes the fact that at the end of the day, the ECG, ECJ will play a role only in identifying, in defining issues of interpretation of EU law, uh, uh, which is a bit kind of the formula we found in Switzerland. Uh, in my view, that's only a, it's a slight variant on what's in the protocol, uh, pro probably acceptable to the EU side, I don't know, uh, but I think something could be done there. Is that enough for the for the British Prime Minister? I don't know. But if he signs if he signs a deal, I assume he thinks he can. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Eugenio. I think we have a question. Eugenio Biasini, University of Cambridge. I've been following with interest uh, everything each of the panelists uh, and Neil has said, and it seems to be much of well, in fact, everything is based on the assumption that all the parties involved want to find a solution. But it seems to me that we should consider also the doomsday scenario. The DUP has played over again, and we asked the unions before then, a card which was based on the assumption that the only people entitled to exercise sovereignty were they. This is for the big 1912, for the big 1920, and time and again since. What happens if they do it again? It's serious, serious risk, but uh, the, the contrary example is 1998, when unionist leadership entered into an agreement and what they secured was uh, agreement on the union. So this, this was something that was very, very strong, and very powerful from the unionist point of view. Uh, and part of the objective going forward in that was to replace the Anglo-Irish agreement. Uh, so what they the risk now is that by um, digging in, in a, on a on the tactical position they're in now that that, that, that takes you back and, and the choice maker for them is to have uh, the union on their terms and, and they would probably say well what does it matter what others think about the union it's our birthright you know that's i was raised in that in that uh, mindset uh, my grandfather signed the covenant in 1912. Uh, you know, as opposed to the different scenario where the union is based on an agreement that they, they gave, that they, they conceded the, the enormous point that was actually at the heart of the Anglo-Irish agreement, which was a Dublin role in the internal affairs of Northern Ireland on a new basis, on an agreed basis. And so that the, the choice for unionism is between going forward on the basis of that approach, which is is consensual and potentially enduring, as opposed to then retreating into, uh, you know, it's our way only. Uh, so that's why leadership does matter. It's very, it's it's a actually another um, uh, choice to be made. Uh, I'm old enough to remember Terence O'Neill's Ulster of the Crossroads speech. In the 1960s, so that, that's that's a choice for unions in Norway. Um, just to answer 
this question a wee bit and also Peter's in relation to the DUP. I was trying to get the latest fine. I can't. So this is on off memory. But the issue of the protocol of the ECJ has um, become increasingly important for people in Northern Ireland. Um, I think it's something like 36% or so say so that they are concerned around about it. Um, even though when you look at the intensity of that concern, it's fairly low. But um, essentially, um, it's gone alongside this process of um, uh, uh, increasingly solid opposition to the protocol that covers more and more bases. Um, and in terms of whether then any deal that may keeps the ECJ role could be solved the DP, I think this goes to, to another point, which is around basically if we're having a UK EU agreement of any sort. Um, the question will be, how will the UK government prepare strong unionism for what will be seen as a betrayal, another betrayal? And I think that's partly because, um, because the government has presented, um, uh, um, has used unionist opposition in, in, in quite cynical ways um, and quite dangerous ways over the past two years in relation to trying to see movement from the EU. And um, I'm, just, I'm just saying as I've seen it. And I think essentially the dangerous part of that is that it hasn't been listening to moderate unionists, sort of lost that, missed that chance. And it's been listening to those um, who have um, expressed serious concerns and doubts about the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. And so this process now, in which they would be want if they want to sell it, get an agreement and sell it, which I, I think they do, um, they need to begin to genuinely listen to unionist concerns, but be careful as to whom they give to whom they're giving sucker. And I think this comes back to the point too about the ERG. So where is the solid ground on which the UK government is going to be making such an agreement? And at some point, at some point. Um, somebody will have to say, you know, why is it that we are, you know, uh, taking these decisions? Because they are having consequences. Mm -hmm. And um, that point of principle and absolutist principles and ideology is not a good basis for decision making. And we are seeing the consequences, the UK as a whole, not just Northern Ireland, the UK as a whole is seeing the consequences. And um, I, I think if, if we're wanting in relation to all these huge issues that the UK is facing, that Europe is facing. At some point, the UK government will have to be courageous enough perhaps to do some evidence-based decision-making when it comes to that UK-EU relationship, uh, even at the risk of um, um, staring down the ERG and indeed the hardliners in the DUP. Great. Thank you, Kitty. And it should be uh, mentioned in case you don't know, Kitty is running this very large ESRC funded project and you're getting your data from opinion polls through, maybe you want to say a bit about that? Uh, yeah. Yes, that's, that's a project led by my colleague David Finnemore, yeah. yeah, post Brexit government. Okay. So yeah, Thanks. and with the data from the um, the surveys being done in time that's with Lucy Cole, that's what yeah. he's running. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Great. Right, because we have so many questions, I'm going to double up. Um, we have uh, Chris Bickerton, um, followed by Tony Watts. Again, please try and keep your questions as brief as possible, because we are running out of time. I encourage the panellists to answer as briefly as they can as well. So Chris yeah. and then Tony, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I had a question from the by uh, David, by the third speaker, and um, he gave us a, a retrospective look at the sort of close 2016 negotiations. Um, and at one point you mentioned uh, Theresa May's checkers to Andrea. Um, so my question to you again, really was, had she been able to sell that to the enemy party, um, would it have also been something that could have been a basis for negotiations with the European Union? Was there ever a realistic plan to be negotiated with the EU or not? I didn't mention the checkers. I mentioned the actual deal, which was negotiated with the EU, which was the backstop. Okay. Which was that the UK that in if it were not possible to eliminate the need for a border somewhere in Ireland through the future trade negotiations, mm -hmm. that the fallback would be the UK would remain within the customs union, and that deal was was by the way 
accepted by the EU with great reluctance by a large number of member states who thought the UK was treated too generously with it, but they swallowed it. And it was agreed. It was part of the package, but it was then rejected by the House of Commons and uh, Boris Johnson came along with the protocol. Okay, so we'll try that double up thing again. Um, <laughs> Sorry, again. Under, okay, no problem. We'll, we'll start with Tony and then Tony, if you ask a question, then please, Catherine Barnard, would you ask the second question, please? Thank you. Tony. Okay. Um, I'm very much on many of these comments. Um, Andrew mentioned the um, trade of mind by the GDP from initial acquiescence to rejection. What was surprising was not the rate of rejection, but the rate of acquiescence. It's difficult, it seems to me, to avoid notions for the current deal under which um, the, the government got there and got Brexit done. Uh, the deal was we know it's its burdens acquiescence and we make sure we're not held to it. Does the panel agree? And if not, what explain the initial acquiescence? Great. Tony, Catherine. Hi, David, thank you for your observations about a uh, simple resolution about the Court of Justice. I just wonder, from a legal perspective, whether you're over optimistic, because Article 12 4 of the Northern Ireland Protocol makes clear it's not just questions of interpretation, but it's a whole kit and caboodle of EU remedies, including enforcement proceedings brought by the, by the Commission for the Court of Justice. And what you're proposing, it seems to me, would require an amendment of Article 12 4, which takes us back to the Fourth Amendment. Well, right. oh, sorry. <laughs> Please. <laughs> well, no, these others have raised um, problems. So, um, can I comment on, 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 on right. this yes. question? Yes. So, um, maybe it was bogus acquiescence, but there, I've also some reason to believe that uh, they thought that they could they could live with it and make it work, uh, and that they, there were some genuine potential ups upsides. I mean, there were, these were mentioned in, in well known speeches by DUP commentators at the time. Uh, so I, I can't see into that all the way. Uh, I think it's very important to, 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 to recognize the risk that, uh, and therefore it's part of why the current situation is so bedeviled by distrust and reestablishing trust is the absolutely fundamental point. Uh, uh, the further thing that's relevant here links to the discussion on the uh, jurisdiction of the court, the Government has set a very high bar, protocol bill or some or or, or the same outcomes. That's as Katie said, that that's not achievable. And the things that might have been acceptable, uh, practical solutions that might have been acceptable a year ago to the DUP are now way far below their expectations. So actually, I come back then to the earlier point. Maybe it's the government that actually doesn't want to deal. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, just very briefly, I mean, you shouldn't forget the DEP was opposed to the protocol and the withdrawal agreement um, in 2019. So we had that unusual situation where all the parties um, from NI um, were opposing the protocol, um, the withdrawal agreement um, vote in the House of Commons. And so that was a sort of unusual collaboration at the time between all the parties and businesses. It was kind of a unique moment. Of course, they, uh, it didn't receive legislative consent either from the newly formed assembly. Um, what made the difference though, when they began to move and to say, you know, as in some famous points, yes, there could be benefits here for Northern Ireland. Well, partly I think they were listening to some business uh, businesses but also, I think they were being told things behind the scenes, possibly about, well, this isn't as bad as it looks, you know, maybe we're basically not going to fully implement it as the EU expects. And, and that's, of course, this, this, this is why it's been so difficult to follow, <laughs> because we're not sure what people are being told behind the scenes that makes such a difference then in the way that they respond uh, publicly and what, the kind of leadership that they show. Uh, and we know that this leadership is so important for people's views on the protocol because in relation to polling, um, we know that people see par political parties that they support as the most reliable sources of information on the protocol. So it's been absolutely critical. And so that behind the scenes stuff, beyond scrutiny, um, possibly not in line with some of the realities and the facts, has actually been really problematic when it comes to implementing the protocol and people's responses to it. Right. Uh, David, you want to tell us the point? Yeah, I, I mean, Look, first thing to be very clear, I, I speak and we have no one, so I mean, I'm, 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 I'm speculating. Um, when you say mandate, I mean, this is very misleading, Kevin. There, there is no issue of a mandate 
the what is on the table at the moment is the protocol as agreed. The question is whether you can make an amendment to that or not. As of now, certainly the EU does not want to have an open-ended renegotiation of the protocol. My sense is that if you can find solutions to many of the practical issues which don't involve amending the protocol as such, but which are about implementation, there may be a willingness. And, and if that is agreed, and there we go to Andrew's point about trust as being, so this is a deal that you're going to stick to, right? Uh, because that's the question. Um, I think there may be a willingness to uh, introduce some nuances in the wording of, of, uh, and make some amendments to, to one or two of the, of the bits and pieces, particularly relating to the ECJ. And in, in my view, it is not beyond the, the wit of man to imagine some weasel wording of that, which will not give uh, the British government everything it wants, uh, which may make it slightly more acceptable. Um, and I want to be very clear that this will be large, largely cosmetic, uh, because the only outcome which is possible is, is basically the implementation of the protocol pretty much as we know it, perhaps with some, you know, uh, changes to the language, which are a gesture in the direction of some of the issues the British have raised. There will not be a fundamental renegotiation of the protocol, absolutely not. Will that be enough for the British government? I don't know. It is all down to the question of whether they, in the grand scheme of things, believe a deal on this issue is important because of relations with Europe in general, uh, the, the war in Ukraine, relations with the United States, uh, the economic situation here in the UK, all of this comes together into, into a political judgment. Do you try and take this irritant out of the system? And can you and, and can you bring your party with you? And can you eventually bring uh, at least a majority of unionists, if not all unionists with you? Um, that's a calculus only the British government can make. Great, okay, thank you, David. I'm gonna um, invite Barry to ask some questions which have come in from our Zoom audience, Barry. Thanks, Liam. I'm very, very conscious of time. Uh, there are many brilliant questions from our online audience. Thank you for being with us. What I'm gonna do is just draw on two of them. Uh, I'm going to put them to each of you, and then I think Neva is going to invite you to make a closing remark, so you can choose to respond to them if you wish or not. Instead of deference for our audience of joint. First one I'll ask is from Karen Banks, who's the formerly of the Legal Service of the EU Commission. And just to summarise, uh, given the UK's consistent bad faith or pressure from the DUP, could the EU believe that adequate checks would be introduced in the case of any arrangement? Secondly, and this is a short question, and it's one I'm sure this. Uh, we've all heard this before, but it's going more than once, so I'll put it to the panel. How much of a risk is the current juncture to peace in Northern Ireland? That's from a couple of people. On, on the first one, uh, the protocol provides for supervision. That itself was a controversial bit in the, in the detailed negotiations on the application of the protocol. So that's, that's the guarantor uh, or, or the means of, means of securing that. Mm -hmm is to have your own your own supervision that's so i think that's possible uh, but but it doesn't uh, undermine the more fundamental point that we won't, we won't get to a deal without some substantial restoration of trust yeah. Lily Davis, no i mean the 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 there, there are ways in which the, the implementation and the oversight can be reduced. Um, it can't be eliminated. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a question of, of risk calculation, mm -hmm. and, and that depends on the guarantees which the British government puts on the table and the ability of the EU to, to, to monitor those and, and to verify. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's trust but verify. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's, that's the balance which has to be found. But uh, the, 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 the most important thing will be a, a commitment from the British government to say this is the deal. We're not going to come back in 12 months' time and and, re, and redo this. You know how many times we have to do this, right? We've been doing it for four years. We got the protocol. Uh, we we now are told we have to amend the protocol. Okay, so let's see if we can adjust things. Uh, but people are going to want to know this has to be the end, uh, mm -hmm. and that will be the key question. All right. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect some questions from people in the room, um, and then I'm going to ask the panel to each individually sum up for one minute. You can either address those questions or your reflections in the conversation, and we'll bring it to a close. So, please, as briefly as we can, and Graham, please, can I take your question? In the context of the panel, I'm to make three points. Great. May I? Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Um, the first of those is that the, the protocol itself makes a huge fuss of protecting the Good Friday Agreement. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all over the place. Yes, the Good Friday Agreement has clearly been damaged, it's, it's, it's not working. Mm -hmm. 
Does that make me back the, the terminal? I mean, there are people now in North London calling for the removal of community consent. Uh, more dangerous suggestion, I find it very hard to imagine, but, but, um, but it's there. Uh, no one on the panel, I think, has mentioned the one made by, brought up by Lord View, and I think I can find Lord Lily in the House of Lords mm -hmm. debates on the, uh, on the first call bit. There's a conflict between the Woodbank agreement and the first call bit. Where you have a comment, I think usually the, the older pieces which would take preference. Mm -hmm. So the responsibility of the UK government uh, is, is effectively to try the agreement more than the first call. I don't think it's, so my, my second point is I, I don't really see if it's helpful to go into the, the history of having got here, it's very sad and convoluted uh, history. Um, uh, the, the history has been well, well, well explained, I think, but particularly in our policy exchange um, by what they lost. Mm -hmm. Explain the, the huge difficulties around the the Bear Act mm -hmm. uh, and the attempt to overthrow Brexit. I mean, yeah. the post my constitution is good in a way, mm -hmm. uh, very difficult. Which government now 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 wants to uh, uh, redeem that because it was reasonable uh, expectation. My final point, mm -hmm. uh, if, if if I may, is it's. Unhelpful, I think, to say the least, but, but very typical, I think, of an academic audience on this uh, topic to always lay into the British government and have to say, no, this isn't all the, the uh, very reminiscent of a sort of uh, four legs, but two legs. Uh, uh, to, uh, is there, what, what does the panel think uh, about the, the alternatives like mutual enforcement, mm -hmm. whereby it would be made illegal to export anything into the EU? Or what do they think about? Everything. Um, you have to leave it there. Yeah, no, 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 technical. Oh, finish very quickly. Um, uh, technical alternatives. The sort of things outlined by uh, Lance Carlson. Would that be the European Parliament's own uh, expert in the mm -hmm. they didn't want to? Great. And, and Ms. Graham Gudgeon, former special advisor to the former Northern Ireland First Minister, Theo Trimble, Lord Trimble, who recently passed away. And thank you for that. Graham, um, yourself, sir, please, as quickly uh, as possible. Yeah, Blair, Blair Horn, a member of the Institute. My question to the panel really is are the, are the DUP really the problem? Is there any solution uh, without a more realistic uh, assessment in GP <laughs> about how uh, limited the protocol negotiations? Uh, are, are, are going to be because the deal was you got the TCN because you read the protocol. Well, you know, you can't have the TCN just read the whole protocol. And the one thing that can't happen is because it would be completely unacceptable to be elected in Ireland, but it can neither be a hard border nor can Ireland be taken out of the single market. Mm -hmm. And that's the consequence of the green panel, just a green lane and no checks. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, we're going to we're going to leave it there. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists to sum up for less than one minute if you can, and then we're going to bring it to a close. So I'm going to go in reverse order. Oh, Dave, you, I'm I'm gonna... Sorry, we're not going to get any responses to the question. Yeah, in the response, yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yes, we are. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, one minute on Graham's. Yeah. Graham, uh, two two points. Um, the Good Friday Agreement is an international agreement written down international law. The protocol is an international agreement in international law. Both of them signed and ratified by the United Kingdom. If you tell me they're in contradiction, the responsibility lies with the British government, nobody else. And I do not know how you can ask the EU to solve that problem. Secondly, on the question of alternative arrangements, this was exhaustively examined. And there is no working model anywhere in the world where those Right, those alternative technological solutions, mutual enforcement, nobody does it anywhere in the world, not between the US and Canada, anywhere you find. They don't work. They have been shown not to work. And our member states, and to do with the bureaucracy in Brussels, our member states will not sign up to anything of that kind because it will not work. It does not provide the necessary guarantees for the integrity of the single market. And that's a proven fact. Great. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. Katie, Katie, please. <laughs> Um, so just um, briefly, um, Graeman Strutsky, I, I speak a lot in Europe as well, and I speak bearing in mind the audience. So when I'm speaking in the EU, for example, to EU member states, 
I'm very critical of the EU as well. Um, and uh, so uh, just to sort of make that point. And I sat alongside Lars Carlson in the European Parliament. I wrote a report with David Finnamore um, that was commissioned by the same committee. And um, I'm not called a European Parliament advisor on that basis. Um, my report had the same status as Lars's. And I know Lars fairly well now. We interact, we work from board management stuff. But um, I think a fundamental point is if technological solutions were the answer, and the UK government really believed that, they would have been fully implemented in relation to the Irish Sea. So the, the fundamental issue is you need, a, you need a legal decision as to where a border lies and how it's going to operate. And it's that ambiguity that remains obviously the issue at stake here. Mm -hmm. um, is the last question, is the DUP really the problem? I think ultimately, if we're being honest, it's not really seen as the problem for the UK government. And I think it's been, it wasn't seen as a problem when, it, when um, Johnson signed the protocol originally. It was sort of sidelined on that. Um, then it became a problem that the UK government has pointed to a lot. And I think we're conscious it might not be seen as a problem anymore, but it remains, it's concerns remain our concerns in, in Northern Ireland and therefore a concern for anybody who's concerned about the Black Friday Belfast Agreement. Um, and then just to conclude on a, on a slightly different note, I'm going to disagree with David. Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah, it's just a bit of, no, not really fundamentally, but I think um, we'd be, we're wrong if we think, if we'd, we'd be unwise to think in terms of having a single package that tries to do everything. So I'm not really disagreeing with you. I'm having a slight different take on it all, in which I think basically um, possibly a better way of doing it would not be to wait for the um, nothing agreed till everything agreed approach, but to have agreements as they arise. So agreements in relation to data, sharing agreement um, in relation to um, tariff rate quotas. Um, and in that way, you can have proper implementation periods for whatever is agreed on technical matters. And you can also build up the trust necessary for them further movement, hopefully, in relation to ECGA, because it's extremely difficult. So, yeah. And that relates to this whole point about the fact that this withdrawal agreement is, through the protocol, is in relation to that ongoing relationship between the UK and the EU. Um, and, and, sorry, yeah. yeah. And so just to put fake deadlines actually just makes us less likely to get good um, agreements ultimately. Great, thank you. Perfect. And Andrew? So, uh, just in good faith, a lot of the ideas that uh, Graham talked about were tried and discussed in the course of the negotiations between maybe 2017, 2018. Um, and the, the, the result of that long process was to come first to the backstop under Theresa May and then to the protocol uh, as it is. And the, the question that remains is, what is the realistic alternative? Uh, I, I beg Shankar Singham's forgiveness for quoting him uh, in his evidence to parliamentary committee saying that there was no solution to the alternative arrangements to the SPS issue because my, my characterization that is, is that you can't stop a pathogen with, with a camera. Uh, that's that, that's why those why DG Sante or the Benoit are 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 so stringent. I, I, someone's looking after my health. I want them to be really rigorous. Um, the the uh, idea that the Ben Act and all that meant that they had no alternative is completely utter rubbish. Uh, the um, agreement in December 2020 was informed by a year of detailed negotiation, and Michael Gove told Parliament it was okay. Grace periods are fine. And actually, in six months' time, we can have the enforcement of the rules on sausages. Uh, read the Hansard of the, of the December announcement. That, that shows that you know, a year after they had a majority, a year after the Ben Act was irrelevant, they said the protocol is okay. Final point what's the alternative? The, the, good, the good Friday Agreement did not foresee these issues. So it, it doesn't. It, I wrote, wrote about, this, about this extensively. It, you have, have to go back more to how we got there and hence process of agreement rather than saying it means this, it means that. That's become part of the problem. Okay, great. Thank you very much. This concludes our first face-to-face -face meeting for the Future of the Island of Ireland series. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, please do follow us and share and spread the word about us. But if you could all, in our usual fashion, thank the panelists for a really great <laughs> Yeah, that's it. That's it.
Sorry, it's a 